Welcome to the Live Full Work Fun Podcast. This is the show to encourage you to live your life to the fullest and do fun work that fuels your lifestyle. Hi, I'm your host, Gayla Scrivener. Every week, you'll be introduced to amazing guests, useful resources, and inspirational stories. You'll discover opportunities and perspectives to shape your version of living full and working fun. Hi there, and welcome to the show. If this is your first time here, I'm glad you're joining me for the very first time. Thanks for checking out the show. If you're returning, welcome back. It's always so great to have you here. Now, are you a part of the Live Full Work Fun community yet? If not, be sure to go over to Facebook and join the Live Full Work Fun Facebook group. It's funny, I think, sometimes there are times when people touch our life in most unexpected ways, and they come into your life in the most needed times. I had that experience with today's guest. Michelle Zabo is a marketing expert who I met in a professional manner collaborating on a project. The project turned out to be much, much more difficult than it really should have been, And not because of the actual project, no. It was because of the few individuals of the group that Michelle and I were trying to help that made things, well, let me say, between the power struggles, the passive-aggressive behaviors, oh my, Michelle and I were struggling, that's for sure. Michelle and I found it difficult to see progress, and it frustrated us, and some of those behaviors were exactly why I left the corporate world to start my own business. Michelle's calm and steadfast ways were such a blessing throughout the difficult project. So that was great. But this was during the one of my most difficult times in my whole life. I was in Chicago. I remember this very vividly. And we were kind of hoping to wind up this project, Michelle and I were but I needed to leave and I went to Chicago to be with my brother when he was in the hospital just days before he passed. Michelle and I happened to have a phone conversation and I was walking around in the hospital waiting room. And that conversation that I had with Michelle helped me put some important things into perspective. She validated my belief that life is too short to be miserable and that it's okay to walk away from a project riddled with drama like that. She too wanted to see the project's success as we both believed in it, but not at the expense of working in such a negative environment. To enjoy the freedom to truly be present for my brother before he left this world, that's what makes all the hard work of creating a business so worth it. But creating a business also means that you can work with those who have a forward and positive effect on your life, which makes working on difficult projects fun. Work fun doesn't necessarily mean free of challenges or difficulties, but the people who you work with make a heck of a lot of difference in living full and making work fun. During that conversation with Michelle, she helped me realize a lot of things to consider in life and in death. She really, really made a positive impact on me. We had lost touch over the years, and I thought I'd drop her a note to see how she was doing and asked her to come onto the show so you can meet her and share her insight on why she started her business. Michelle is a marketing, communications, and creative management professional who thrives on bringing together data analysis, technical needs, brand objectives, creative, and company goals to move businesses forward. Her company, White Light Concepts, helps businesses with their digital footprint by creating websites and marketing materials that help them communicate more clearly. Her clients include ADP, American Express, Consumer Reports, Cody, International Creative Management, J. Walker Thompson, Nestle, MTV, NHL, PepsiCo, Pfizer, School of Visual Arts, United Nations, UPS, and many others. 
When Michelle and I were talking, we couldn't help but meander into talking marketing. I am so appreciative that she shared some great tidbits on many things in growing a business. Marketing plays a huge part of business building. But whether you're going into business for yourself or not, she shares a lot that falls right into the Live Full Work Fun philosophy. Well, here we go. I'm delighted for you to meet Michelle. Well, hey there, Michelle. I'm so glad that you're here with me today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Gayla. Thanks for having me. It has been a long time since we've seen each other, and I have been anxious to kind of catch up. Before we get started, would you care to tell everyone a little bit about yourself that might have not been incorporated into the intro? You know, my background is really varied. And as I'm sure you know, because, you know, we had some contact uh, several years ago through SCORE, right? You know, we worked together and that was, you know, great fun. And it kind of took a lot of my background. You know, I, I came from a corporate background and, you know, I even worked for a printing company at one point long ago, um, you know, running presses and things like that. <laughs> Very that sounds early fun. in my career. Yeah, it was great. And it was uh, dirty. (laughs) But I I really, you know, kind of grew with the industry, right? You know, we had, you know, DVDs came into play, you know, computers and the Mac became really hot in, you know, the 90s and stuff. And I was asked to teach um, at School of Visual Arts. And I taught there for eight years, you know, when all of the computer art was just kind of getting going. Yeah. And then, you know, after the creative, you know, I kind of just naturally moved into the marketing end. So, well, I've always known you through white light concepts and you just mentioned that you came from the corporate world. What got you to the journey of starting white light concepts? Well, white light concepts was actually one of a few different companies that I was involved with. Prior to white light concepts, I worked for Micropower Group and Micropower Design. That was a rather large group of five companies. Uh, we were in the Empire State Building down in Manhattan. We worked for oh gosh, a whole variety of companies, mostly larger companies. Um, we worked for the New York Metropolitan Transit Authority, Pfizer. New York State Department of Health, Admit One, which was a ticketing agency, you know, just lots of, you know, larger clients. You know, I decided that uh, after that, I wanted to go back to working on my own and kind of downsizing. I should tell you that, of course, uh, Micropower was uh, that whole time with, you know, 9-11 and the dot-com crash and all kinds of craziness happening, right? So after that, I kind of moved back to Connecticut and decided that I was going to uh, downsize and, you know, make it, you know, more of my own. It also gave me the flexibility to be able to homeschool my kids, which was really nice. So that was, you know, a great experience as well. So how long has White Light Concepts been in existence? Yeah, uh, since 2005. Awesome. Yeah. So it's been around a little while. (laughs) So you had the flexibility by creating your own firm. You had the flexibility finding your your own clients. You homeschooled your kids. You're not in Connecticut anymore, are you? I am. Yes. I you well, are? you know, as yeah, I you know, as you know, I went to uh, Missouri yeah. for a little while. Then I moved back to Connecticut about uh, let's see, I guess it's three years ago. Wow, this, three years ago we this month. I have actually. lost touch. Yes. Oh my goodness! But they gave you the flexibility. You didn't have to close your business to no, not at all to move. That's the beauty of it. That is yeah, awesome. actually. Yeah, I went from Connecticut and I went to New Mexico and then to Missouri and then back to Connecticut. Wow. And you didn't have to close down business, find a new job nope. or anything like that. Nope. So you work with your clients on a virtual or in-person basis, depending on where they're located, I guess. Yeah. I, you know, there are some clients that I have that I've never even met face to face, you know, and, and some, some of those are even in New York. <laughs> so, you know, they're close by, but you know, there's just not been a need. You bring together the creative, the technical, the data. What does all that mean? How do you serve your clients? Well, the biggest thing, Gayla, is that, you know, clients come to me to solve some kind of a problem. I mean, yes, sometimes it's just, you know, hey, build me a website or hey, create me a logo or, you know, create this flyer or whatever. But a lot of times it has to do with, you know, how are they going to promote something, whether it's their company 
or whether it's some type of a service. And they're kind of stuck. They're like, you know, what do I do with all this? You know, they don't know what to do with social. They don't know what to do with, you know, their website. They don't know what to do with anything, you know, really, you know, where does PR fit into the mix, you know? And for some people, PR fits and some people it doesn't, you know, some social media fits for some people, other social media doesn't, as you well know, right? I really kind of take a step back when I first start talking to someone and say, you know, okay, you know, what's the whole point of this? Because we don't want to miss the point. You know, I could churn out websites or churn out flyers or whatever, but if I don't understand the point and what the objective is, the business objective, you know, and why we're going after something, then it's not going to really be satisfactory to them. So do you find that, I know I'm kind of guilty at it, but it seems like a lot of us don't take that step back. And they, they come to somebody and they want instant satisfaction. How do you handle somebody that is so quick that they are just like, well, I just want yeah. social media well, I start, or whatever? Yeah. I start asking them questions, you know, well, you know, why do you want this? What are you hoping to accomplish, you know, in doing this? You know, if they can answer that, then that's great. Then they, you know, they've thought it through, right? I can't tell you how many people have come to me with, you know, brand new businesses and said, you know, oh, you know, I need a website and I need this and I need that. And, you know, I need all these things. And I'm like, well, hold on a second. You know, what's your business plan? And they don't even have a business plan. So, you know, they haven't really thought through what their objectives are and where they want to go with all of this. And if I can get that data, that information, that analysis from them, then I can be much more effective in what I'm doing. I've heard more than once that we should be asking of our clients or we should be asking of, of folks, why seven times? Because if if they give you the answer to the first why, why then when you ask why again, then they, you get deeper and deeper and deeper. And, and yes. I love that. It's interesting when you say, a business plan when you think of business plans as somebody that uh, has a, maybe a brick and mortar business and you got to create a business plan to maybe get a, a bank loan because you got to present that, right? Well, what about if you want to create an online business? What should someone that's starting an online business, a coaching business or anything like that, because that is something that's pretty prevalent. You just start doing and you don't have a plan. Yeah. It, you know, I think one of the first things that I always ask people are what are the top three things you want your ideal customer to know? What are those things? Right. And do those things match up with where you're going? You know, these things have to match, right? Because if they don't, then, you know, you're just kind of throwing things at the wall things just kind of go at the wall and, you know, what sticks, sticks. Maybe for some people, maybe that works, but most of the time, not so much. You know, you're spending an awful lot of money. Um, I recently had a client that um, they spent $18,000 over, I think it was a year or so, maybe a little bit more, maybe about 18 months in Google ads. And they were just throwing up Google ads, throwing, absolutely no return on them at all. In the last three months, they have spent about $2,000 and the return has been over 40 fold because of the way I focused the specific ads and made sure that, you know, we were being very targeted, very strategic. So all of a sudden, you know, they had wasted this $18,000 and now, you know, for just $2,000, they're getting a return on investment. You know, what a, I mean, what a difference that is when you really think through it. So what I'm hearing is we as a business owner, no matter how big or small, if we're reaching out for help from somebody else, we want them to ask a lot of questions because they'll do a better job for us. It's really good. Um, you know, I know a lot of people try to, you know, do their own Google ads and do their own website and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. But I can't say it enough times, you know, really search out a professional whether it's me or whether it's you or whether, you know, somebody else, but somebody who has some experience with doing all of these things, it will come back to you. You know, the return on investment is going to be huge. It really doesn't make a difference. I mean, I, I can't imagine being a brand new business owner right now and trying to figure out, oh, what do I do with my website? Oh, geez, I had to get business cards. Um, oh, I had to uh, set up my social media. Oh, which social media? 
hmm, let me go do all that research. And all of a sudden, you know, you're spending hours and hours and hours, days and days and days of your time to do all of this. It's not a good return on your investment. No, as a as a solopreneur, it's the the tendency that, oh, we need to do it all or I'm going to learn it all because there's no budget. What's a good piece of advice on what maybe should be the first thing that uh, when we're starting a business, what should we delegate first? Yeah. I mean, you know, with being, you know, everything being so virtual right now, I would say, you know, the first thing is you want to get your face up there, right? You want that website because having a decent website right from the go, it doesn't have to be the most elaborate, it doesn't have to be the most expensive, but something that tells people what it is that you do. And if you can have somebody helping you defining what you do, whether that's a coach, whether it's a marketing person, you know, somebody who is from the outside looking in and really querying you about what it is that you want to do. Where do you want to take this? What do you have to offer? When you were starting your business, what do you know now that you wish you knew then? Would you have done anything differently? I don't think so because, you know, I've been a part of a few startups. You know, I was part of, you know, of course, Micropower. That was, um, you know, when we created Micropower Group and its subsidiary companies, you know, those were all very much brand new. We had a software arm, we had a group overseeing arm, a design arm, which I handled, and, um, you know, a couple of others. I would say just taking the time to really understand what it is you want, where you're going, who your ideal client is, really super important. You know, I mean, you can throw a whole lot of things out there, you know, just like the Google ads, right? If you just, you know, keep throwing them out there, all you're doing is wasting money, right? You're not going to get any good return on investment. But if you can really understand who those ideal clients are for you, then go after them. You know, even if it's small, you know, you can start small and you can always expand later. You know, I know everybody wants to, you know, go out, and, you know, guns blazing and you know everything's happening, right? And um, you know, they're going to be great and famous and wonderful and and all of that. And the reality is that you really need to kind of start small. You know, get your feet wet and start moving. Some companies will move much faster. You know, if you're in a really vibrant niche that, you know, is really in need, you know, I mean, some companies, you know, grow like crazy, right? They might go from two or three people to 50 people and then a hundred people, you know, within a couple of years. So, you know, that's exponential growth, but I'll bet they started small to begin. So many of us who start out, our net is too big. We're just saying we'll help anyone. And if we just niche down from the beginning, which is scary, but if we say we help anyone, we really haven't put much thought in who our ideal client is. What if you're unsure? Do you have any advice? If, if you, okay, I think I've niched down, but what if I want to change? Well, you know, you certainly can, um, you know, as a solopreneur or, you know, a small business owner, you know, you might start in one place and then you say to yourself, you know, I've started here and, you know, maybe it's not working as well as you hoped. Take a look at it and say, well, you know, am I saying something wrong or is there really not a market here? Did I not do enough, you know, research to see if there was really a market for what I'm trying to do? You know, that's very possible. That's another reason why, you know, you're your data and your thinking and your business plan and all of that beforehand is so important right? because you don't want to go down that road if you can help it. And can you shift later? Sure. You know, it might be a complete shift. It might be just growth and expansion. You know, it all depends. And you, know, you can't really say what it would be specifically for each company or, you know, for each person because everything, you know, it's always different, right? Now, is it just you or do you have a team? I do happening. have a team, but everybody is virtual. So, you know, we, it, depending on, you know, what we need to do, whether it's a, a website, you know, design, copy, uh, programming, 3D work, whole variety of different things, you know, we can, you know, social media, public relations, <laughs> you know, there's lots of different pieces of the marketing puzzle, right? You know, I work with people who I know are good in those areas. Um, sometimes I will take on, you know, the projects myself, depending on which project it is. And then other times I will, you know, bring others in to do things as well. What's been your biggest challenge in growing and running your business? Dare I say billing? <laughs> I hear you. <ya. laughs> you know, sitting down, you know, because you want to do the work, right? You want to 
make all the bells and whistles and all the sparkly things happen and you know and all that kind of stuff and then you go oh geez okay now i have to bill it but then of course you know you realize oh this is good <laughs> so um i'd say you know yeah just kind of like the administrative stuff right that's probably one of my biggest challenges to like sit myself down and say oh okay i have to take care of this part of it right now, do you delegate any of that or do you do it all yourself? No, the um, things like billing and, um, you know, the really tight administrative work I do myself. Well, you know, the, the saying is like, okay, you're supposed to do everything that you love and delegate the rest. Well, right. I find that we're business owners that some things like the billing, it behooves us to keep that to ourselves, to have a pulse on it. Um, at least to a certain point, even I don't like to do that. I've realized in my later years, I don't, I like this creative stuff. Why do I have to go <laughs> to this bookkeeping stuff? Yeah, but it's good for me as a business owner yes. to go back to the numbers, right? And it's very good, yeah. And have our you know our fingers on the on the numbers so that we know how to pivot if we need to pivot. Right, right. I think at some point, you know, I would delegate that. But honestly, I've never wanted to get that big to where I would, you know, lose sight of that. I've always really prided myself in having a very close connection with my customers and being able to, you know, be on the phone with them, answer their questions, you know, be available. You know, I know there's a lot of companies out there, whether they're marketing companies, you know, agencies, you know, and, and they get big. And I think that's great. I've never really wanted to be that big to where, you know, I have to delegate all these different things, you know, and because then, you know, I feel like I'm on, you know, like that hamster wheel, right? <laughs> well, we can, I mean, I guess it just depends on individual preference. You can be a small business with number wise, like how many employees or how many clients you serve, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your bottom line is tiny. That's correct. And I don't know about you, but I love and pride myself on long-term clients yes. and it's so much easier to just work with clients and that you know and love. I have a client right now that we're on 13 years, which is really cool, you know, and they're great. They're a fabulous client and we work really, really well together, really well. Um, you know, I've gotten to fun. the point, yeah, you know, and I've gotten to the point now after, you know, all this, this time with them you know, I can anticipate and say, you know, hey, do we need to do this? Or, you know, should we do that next? Or, you know, when we're talking, I can, there are times when, you know, we even finish each other's sentence. It's frightening, <laughs> right? But um, it's, it's great. It's a wonderful relationship and we get things done really well. And, you know, management is happy and it's worth it for them. So, you know, it, it really is, um, I think it, it's great if you can get that. It's fun to problem solve together. It's like a partnership almost. It, yeah, it really, really is, Gala. I feel like every client that I work for, I used to freelance a number of years ago. And, you know, when you freelance, you come in, you do the work, you leave, right? It's boom, 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 to, you know, boom, 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 in and out. You know, that's fine. You know, you can make the bucks doing that. But I found it so much more satisfying to be able to sit with a client really understand what's going on, really be able to talk through everything. And, and this is what got me into marketing, you know, from the creative end, because I was able to really start to think about what it is they were after, you know, rather than somebody just handing me something and saying, we need you to do this. It, it really is a partnership. And I feel that with all of my clients at this point. And usually the ones that I don't feel it with, if they're not interested in that, I generally don't work for them very long. <laughs> You know, because you know, I'd much rather have that partnership. I was going to ask you, what's your biggest reward in in your business? It kind of sounds like we're alluding to that with relationships. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's funny. I, I forget who said it. I love it when a plan comes together. I, I forget where that comes from. But, you know, that's kind of what just went through my mind. You know, it, it's really great to see kind of, you know, the fruits of your labor happening, Right. You know, you've done all this planning, you've done all this work, you know, kind of like, you know, in your cave doing, you know, all of this stuff, right? You know, all of a sudden, you know, as you roll things out and things kind of start to hook together 
and you see the social working together with your website, working together with, you know, your PR and, you know, and the phone starts ringing and, you know, and all this stuff starts happening. I think that's one of the things that's really just great, you know, and then of course, you know, seeing the return on investment, right? I think one of the things that, you know, can be really challenging for people. And as a matter of fact, I went through this with somebody fairly recently is, you know, I just kept saying, you need to get the website in better shape because I can't help you with writing new content and stuff like that if we're working with a website that is ancient. And, you know, I, I will have a hard time getting you any really good search engine results. You know, all of these things go into it. So that's one of the things that, you know, when, you know, the guy next door says, oh, I build websites, please don't. <laughs> You know, unless they actually do that for a business and they really understand, you know, search engine optimization and they understand marketing and, you know, it's more than just kind of building that site, right? If you really want it to work for you. And it takes some time to get things settled in, but with that consistency and getting that structure and that baseline, it does seem like all of a sudden, hey, <laughs> things are working and they're meshing, you know, it takes a little bit of patience. It does take patience and you will see, you know, one of the things that, you know, people should always be doing is measuring and tracking, right? And it is well worth investing in some online services that will do that for you. And, you know, there's a ton of them out there that will do it. You know, when you start to see those numbers go up, when you see, oh, wow, you know, we're getting better positioning on these keywords and we're getting more visits to the website and things like that. And then you can start saying, okay, well, is that generating more business? Well, maybe it is. And if it isn't, okay, what do we have to do better, right? So you're constantly tweaking as you're moving forward. And I think that's expectations. Let me jump over to expectations really quick, because I think that's one of the things that potential clients sometimes don't understand what the realistic expectation is for something. You know, they come to you and they say, I want to do this. And, you know, I've got nothing to support it. <laughs> so, you know, make a miracle happen. First of all, it's unfair. It's unfair to themselves to have those types of expectations. And it's unfair to the people that they're hiring too, because they're not going to be able to really deliver, you know, not well. I would say that, uh, you know, just being careful of those expectations are really important and really talking that through as a marketer, you want to talk through that with your clients or potential clients in terms of what those expectations are for any particular project or business. Well, let's, let's dive a little bit more into expectations. Is there the top question that they may have and you're like, hey, we need to talk about expectations? Yeah, the first thing that usually, I, and I've seen this a number of times now, is, you know, the build it and they will come syndrome. You know, build that website and all of a sudden everybody's going to, you know, come flocking to it. It's not a website. It's a little piece of this marketing puzzle. And it's an important piece because people go to it. They want to know about you. They want to know your background, what you do, what you cost, what, you know, all of these different things, right? You know, to expect someone to build you a website and all of a sudden everything is just going to take off and, you know, make you a ton of money. Can it happen? Sure. You know, <laughs> but not very often, not very often. Yes, because there's so much intertwined. Who are your ideal clients? My ideal clients are usually small to medium businesses that need the marketing help. They're overworked or they're stuck. They don't know what to do next or they don't know what to do first, <laughs> depending on what stage their business is at. You know, they really just, they need that, you know, fractional help, right? I, I kind of, you know, market myself as a fractional marketing director or a fractional creative director who can help them with all of those marketing kind of related issues and kind of get them going so that, you know, they're going off in the right direction. And a lot of times, you know, they can just take it over, you know, once they, you know, once we kind of get that ball rolling for them, then they can take it over and just keep moving forward for building a website for them. Then oftentimes, you know, we're doing the maintenance on the website, but usually they can too, if they have some knowledge. It all depends, you know, it really depends on the client and what they will take from us after we've kind of started and, you know, gotten them established in all the different spheres that they need to be established in. I love all this insight that you're giving us. You had mentioned a good thing for all of us to do is to 
check numbers or to have data. There's a lot of different tools out there. Do you have a favorite tool that you retrieve data or is there like one, if we're not tracking anything, track this one thing and how often? Yeah, I would say, especially for those that are just starting out, get everything tied into Google Analytics. You know, if you want to do Google ads, that's great. I would make sure that you're at least looking at your Google Analytics and have that tied into your website because you can start to see trends of what's happening, where people are coming from, and, you know, what keywords they're using to get in there and see your website. The other thing is Google Search Console, which is very important also. And, you know, you can tie those two tools together. And those are both free. So, you know, there's no excuse not to have those in there. And if, you know, if you as a business owner can't tie those things into your website, that's okay. You know, get somebody who can, but don't not do that because otherwise you are working blind and you have nothing to work off of. Once you've become more successful and, you know, you need more information, more data, you can go to things like, um, HubSpot or SitePoint or gosh, SEMrush, you know, there's a whole lot of different tools out there that you can use, but they're going to start to cost, you know, you'll have a monthly fee or a yearly fee on those. And when to do that will all depend on your business and, you know, how much you're really paying attention to the marketing. So, you know, if you're really not going to do anything with the tool, don't waste your money. Just stick to the Google free tools. Otherwise, if you really want to kind of, you know, start moving things forward and start being very strategic in terms of the, um, you know, the keywords that you're going after and who your competition is, because through these other paid tools, you can look at your competition as well, see what they're doing, see what they're ranking for, right? And how they're doing it. So there's a lot to be learned in using these paid tools. Again, at least those Google free tools are really, really important to start understanding who you're talking to. Well, Michelle, I would love for you to share maybe your favorite resource or your favorite book that has really made a difference for you professionally. Oh, that is a tough one. You know, I read things all the time. You know, I'm constantly looking at, you know, like a search engine journal, I I believe it's called, is, you know, a great resource for search search engine information. You know, HubSpot has a tremendous blog of, you know, information. The one thing I would be careful of if, uh, you know, people are getting things online or books as well, you know, books take a while to come out, right? You might, somebody might be writing a book and it might be a great book, but they wrote about it a year ago and then it came out. And now all of a sudden things have changed. Not necessarily always, but in the marketing sphere and digital marketing, things change fast. So you're really going to want to be looking at those online resources like Search Engine Journal or HubSpot, or um, I'm sure I could come up with a list of other things uh, not being on the spot. <laughs> but, um, you know, and just you know, read those things and watch the dates because they'll have a lot of things that are archived or, you know, older articles and things. So make sure that, you know, if you're doing a Google search for something and you want to learn about something, understand when that was, you know, that particular thing was written so that, you know, you can kind of put it in context for yourself. I found that that's one of the things that's really important. Michelle, it's been such a pleasure to have you on the show today. I'm so glad that you spent time with me today. And how do people get in contact with you? Well, they can easily find me on LinkedIn. Just type in Michelle Subbo. Um, that's M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E-S-Z-A-B-O. That's probably the fastest way to kind of find me. You can also email me at michelle at whitelightconcepts.com. Anybody has any questions or anything like that, I'm glad to answer them and, uh, you know, just reach out. Excellent. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you, Gala. Appreciate it. Well, thanks for being here with me today. Be sure to scroll down to the show notes and pull those links of the resources Michelle mentioned, as well as her contact information if you want to follow her. Michelle and I like to talk shop and different areas of marketing, and I think she said some very important points about expectations. Maybe it's because of the speed that everything on the interwebs go that we sometimes get a little skewed expectation of a quick windfall of results, like become an overnight success. Those people who have appeared out of nowhere and are suddenly famous had really worked hard, 
laying down the groundwork, learning the lessons from doing, taking the chances, working through their uncertainty and fear to achieve what they wanted to achieve. They weren't overnight successes. Took a heck of a lot of work to get to where they wanted to be. And for some, once they got there, they realized what they were going after no longer made their life full or their work wasn't fun anymore. You see, they're brave enough to maybe pivot and continue to try new things and challenge themselves to make their life full. I got a bit sidetracked here. Sorry about that. But hearing Michelle's story, Michelle's journey, and marketing pointers really helps me to stay grounded and real in knowing that the most important thing in building an online business well, for any business for that matter, is nurturing relationships one person at a time. Well, I want to get to know you a little bit better. Let's continue this conversation. Hop over to Facebook and post what your biggest takeaway from today's show was in the Live Full Work Fun Facebook group. I hope you enjoyed the episode and I'd love for you to do me a teeny weeny favor. Please share this episode with at least one person, just one person, who you think may find it helpful and enjoyable. Just text the link to them. Well, thanks again for listening, and until next time, have a fantastic week. Live full and work fun.